Hi, I'm Dr. Ted Rosen, Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Dermatology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Republic of Texas. And we're gonna talk about systemic disease and skin of color. There are whole books written on this subject. So I can't cover all of that in this lecture. So I've just selected a few things to talk about, especially when there was something important or new or something I, I wanted to make sure you recognize. So this is not intended to be in any way, shape or form an all-inclusive lecture on this subject. It's just a few selected things, okay? There's my conflict of interest. All those relationships have been discontinued and none of them bore any relationship at all to this talk. So I, I just want to point one thing out. Skin of color is kind of a all-inclusive catch term, if you will. We sometimes think of it as black people, but even if you think about African Americans, even in Africa, there are different skin tones, darker skinned in West Africa, lighter skinned in North Africa, like Egypt, Morocco, the Sudan. And then there are all these other groups who comprise skin of color, large group Hispanic of a variety of backgrounds, also large group Asian individuals, Japan, Korea, China, and all the other countries that comprise Asia. And then a whole sort of other people, the Middle East individuals, skin of color, those from the Caribbean maybe skin of color, Native Americans, those Eskimos, Pacific Islanders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These all comprise skin of color. I'm going to talk in a very narrow sense. And when it's important to identify which group from among this broad category I'm talking about, I will do so. Sometimes I'm only talking about one. Sometimes I'm talking about several. And as I said, I will try to identify that. I think the most important thing is to understand two things. First thing is morphology may be different in different skin of color groups compared to Caucasians, morphology. Second thing, sometimes therapy needs to be different because therapies don't always work uniformly among different groups. And that's why the current rules, the FDA wants pivotal studies to include adequate representation of a variety of groups. So we're sure that a drug works equally well in everybody, or if not, we're aware of it. And by the way, this particular graphic, I did not make up myself. I give credit to Pearl Grimes, who published this in the Cosmetic Dermatology back in 2003. It's a, a very, very, good representation. So I'm going to start with sarcoidosis because I think it's one of the most important systemic diseases we see in skin of color, but in a very narrow sense. So who gets this? American Blacks, more common than any other ethnic group. Peak incidence is 20 to 40. It's more common in women than men by a ratio of two to one. Look at African-American women, 40 per 100,000 incidents. African-American men, just slightly less than that, 30 per 100,000. Compared to Caucasians, nine to 10 per 100,000, men and women. But look at other individuals in that skin of color category who have very low incidence of sarcoid. Hispanic individuals in general, about four per 100,000. Asian indige individuals in general, 
about three per 100,000. So what we're talking about here is a disease that's more common. And I will let the cat out of the bag. It's more severe in African-American or black individuals. Yes, you can see it worldwide in all sorts of ethnicities, but this is a really high risk group. We think it's a reaction, uh, cell mediated reaction, hypersensitivity to something, some antigen. We do not know what that is. There may be a genetic component because there are certain things that are often but not uniformly found, which I've listed here. This is a multi system polymorphic, which means it looks like all sorts of things, disorder. Systemic disease may be occult, you may not see it. You may not have symptoms referable to it, but it's very important. And it can be fatal, sarcoid can be fatal, one to 5%, and we'll review treatment. This, I cannot emphasize this enough because skin manifestations of sarcoid are common. There are differing numbers, but somewhere between 30 and 60% of black patients with sarcoid will manifest with skin signs. And yet they may have occult systemic disease, which is very important to monitor and treat. So multi-system disease, dactylitis, these sausage-shaped digits, swollen sausage-shaped digits that I've illustrated here. It can involve bone, and when it does, it's destructive. Look at those areas, compare that to the rest of the bony structures, which are normal, just destroying, involving with granulomas, that's the nature of the disease, involving and destroying bone. In the eyes, this can involve lacrimal glands, which can be swollen. Usually there's a feeling like gritty feeling or dry eye type feeling associated with lacrimal gland involvement. It can be bilateral or unilateral. Of course, we all associate sarcoid with pulmonary disease. And that can vary from just hilar adenopathy all the way to parenchymal involvement with fibrosis of the lung tissue, pulmonary hypertension, uveitis, inflammation of the eye, enlargement of and granulomatous inflammation of the liver or the spleen. The heart, a very, very important thing because it may be asymptomatic, occult, and yet, Cardiac involvement is the deadliest form of sarcoid. CNS can be involved. Overall, big picture, extrathoracic sarcoid, so not the lungs, outside the chest, 30 to 50% of patients. I found this is a relatively recent research letter uh, from a well known institution where they looked at sarcoid involving all ethnicities, black, white, Asian, Hispanic. Black patients, they were all presenting with skin sarcoid. Black patients with skin sarcoid were 70% more likely to have extracutaneous disease than all the other patients comprising the non-black patient cohort, 70%. So you may make the diagnosis of cutaneous sarcoid, but you have to keep this in mind. Let's go one step further. Black patients were at the highest risk of cardiac sarcoid. A third had cardiac sarcoid, way more common than in the rest of the cohort of their sarcoid patients who did not identify as African American or black. Often. Often, this was asymptomatic and only discovered by imaging, which I'll talk about in just a second. So you have to remember this. It's an important point. You may say, oh, you have skin disease. 
are you short of breath? No, I'm not short of breath. Okay, you can't just leave it there. They need to be worked up. And cardiac disease, as I have just said, may be silent. Let's talk about skin for a second, since we're in dermatology. These are some of the types of skin findings one can see with sarcoid. Classic lupus, perneo, annular, psoriasis form, ichthyosiform, verrucous, ulcerative, hypopigmented, nodular, micropapular, and even alopecia. This is classic lupus perneo. These purplish red asymptomatic generally nodules seen around the orifices, around the eyes, around the nose, around the mouth. This is classic cutaneous sarcoid. But look at all these other things. These are all sarcoid too, biopsy proven. Ichthyosis looking, micropapular. See those little tiny bumps right above her upper lip line? That's micropapular sarcoid. Nothing could look different between that one and the next one. Verrucous sarcoid looks like a big wart. Sometimes it looks a little more psoriasiform. That's sarcoid. These two have annular lesions. And the one showing the neck has papules and plaques as well. Hypopigmentation. There can be substance underneath it, or it can just be macular, flat, hypopigmentation. But when you biopsy, there are sarcoidal granulomas underneath it. And last but not least, ulcerative sarcoid. This is probably the most rare version, but ulcers. None of these look alike. These are all sarcoid. And look at this gentleman. He's got dyschromia. He's got erosions. He's got nodules. He's got a little bit of everything, every type of sarcoid almost from a morphologic standpoint. But if he walked in, would you be thinking sarcoid? Remember, multiple morphologies any of which or any combination of which can be seen. Remember, unlike other groups in black patients, extracutaneous disease is common, almost three quarters of patients. So you need to look for extracutaneous disease and it needs to be treated sometimes along with and the same way that you're treating the skin, sometimes with additional medications, and it needs to be appropriately monitored. Tests, hypercalcemia, not uncommonly accompanies sarcoid. You wanna know that so you don't get kidney stones. There might be a hypergamma globulinemia, so a serum protein electrophoresis is reasonable. The angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE level is a little controversial because it may or may not be elevated in sarcoid. If it's elevated, that reflects a large granuloma load. And if it's elevated in cutaneous diseases, mild to moderate, there are granulomas elsewhere. It's a message to look for occult disease. The three next things that are in yellow instead of white, those are research tools. They're very sensitive, but you can only get them in a few select medical centers. Everybody with sarcoid on the skin needs a chest x-ray to look for everything from hilar adenopathy to pulmonary parenchymal disease to pulmonary fibrosis. And scans are advisable. An MRI is probably the best thing to look for asymptomatic occult cardiac sarcoid which needs to be monitored because it's deadly, and a CT scan for the lung to make sure that there's nothing that has been missed by chest x-ray. Gallium scan used to be done. It's now been replaced with a PET scan. That might be another thing to do to look for foci of sarcoid. Where is the disease and what might it be affecting? 
treatment. Iffy treatments include allopurinol. Thalidomide seems to be helpful, at least in some studies. One study, it wasn't helpful. But of course, you can't do thalidomide forever because you get neuropathy. Isotretinoin, very little literature, very questionable literature on the efficacy of tetracycline derivatives for sarcoid, but there's some literature suggests it might be helpful. And chlorambucil, which is a leukemia drug at low dose, may also be helpful. Standard reliable agents for sarcoid. Not everyone is reliable for every patient. So a bit of it's trial and error. Steroids, both topical, systemic, and interlesional injection. Antimalarial agents, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is usually used, it's better tolerated. Six and a half milligrams per kilogram per day or less. Methotrexate, orally, 10 to 25 milligrams single weekly dose. And anti-TNF drugs, not etanercept, because it blocks a receptor. What you want is something that will soak up the TNF that are in, is deposited in tissue. TNF is responsible for the maintenance of the granuloma. And if there's no TNF there, the granuloma falls apart. Ergo, the disease is treated. So the two that are most widely used, neither approved. In fact, none of this is approved for sarcoid, but infliximab and adalimumab. Usually using adalimumab requires weekly, not every other weekly dose. And infliximab, every eight weeks, IV infusion, five milligrams per kilogram, you can go up. But when you go above five milligrams per kilogram on your infliximab infusions, there are more risks of side effects. So the big four, steroid, antimalarial, methotrexate, anti-TNF, they can be used together if need be. If one doesn't work, it can be replaced. If it works partially, you can add something to it. Those are the best ways to treat sarcoma. Do remember this. Here's an example. There's a hydroxychloroquine treated patient. Notice the plaques on his neck, which essentially disappear. There's a patient treated with infliximab. Notice the large plaques and nodule on the nose disappear. But keep this in mind. Treatment for sarcoid is not curative. When those lesions are gone, they're not cured. They're suppressed. So in general, treatment must continue. And that's also true for cardiac involvement, for pulmonary involvement, for osseous involvement, for joint involvement, for eye involvement. It's always suppressive. You're trying to control the disease, not necessarily cure the disease. Let's move on to hydradenitis separativa. Now, true, that mostly manifests on the skin, but there are lots of systemic comorbidities. And that's why I've included it in this discussion. So who gets hydradenitis? So these are a bunch of studies on the prevalence of hydradenitis. Some of them are unreliable because where they were done. For example, the first study shows that, sar that, that hydradenitis is seen in 90.3% of those who had it were Caucasian. Well, a study was done in Olmsted County, Minnesota, which is, as near as makes no difference, 100% Caucasian. The second study down there shows 54.4% of those who developed hydradenitis were African-American. But that study was done in downtown Detroit at Henry Ford Hospital where the majority of patients are African-American and so forth. Most of these studies have a flaw. The one I think is the best is the last one. That was done in Cincinnati, Ohio. And you can see while both African-Americans and Caucasians to a lesser extent, 3.9% were Hispanic and Asian, will get hydradenitis. 
a majority, over 50% were African-American. But look at the, at the time this study was done, look at the composition of the county in which Cincinnati resides. It's 69% Caucasian, but 43% of those who got hydradenitis were Caucasian. It was only 26.1% African-American, but 52.5% of those who got hydradenitis were African-American. So, and other groups were reflected about in the incidence, 3.9%. So I think that based on this study, we can clearly say hydradenitis tends to be more common in skin of color, in particular in black individuals. Not exclusive, not quite like sarcoid, but more common. It carries a very large psychosocial burden, everything from depression, lack of self-confidence, decreased social functioning, interferes with personal relationships because of odor and the purulent discharge, stains clothes leading to embarrassment. So it really affects quality of life. But interestingly enough, in an analysis based on the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, hydradenitis had a larger negative impact on overall quality of life measurements among Hispanic and African-American patients who suffer from this disease than it did among Caucasians. So not just skin, but quality of life and psychosocial issues are more severe in skin of color. Here are some of those comorbidities I mentioned earlier. Oh my God, metabolic syndrome in 40% of those who have hydradenitis, including obesity, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and hypertension. There may be spondyloarthropathy up to 50% plus, inflammatory bowel disease, increased risk of polycystic ovary syndrome. We've already talked about psychosocial issues, but overdiagnosed depression. Small increased risk of lymphoma, certainly increased risk of anemia due to blood loss and thyroid dysfunction. So that's why I've included hydradenitis among the systemic disorders seen in skin of color because of some of these. Also keep in mind that almost exclusively in black patients, you can see in association with hydradenitis, the so-called follicular occlusion triad or tetrad. Hydradenitis, acne conglobata, way past the normal age of acne, dissecting cellulitis of the scalp, and pilonidal cysts is the rest of the tetrad. So one should always inquire and look for these other potential problems. I think of major importance is the fact that squamous cell carcinoma can occur in hydradenitis. So you look at this patient, you have multiple draining nodules, but you've got one that's a little bigger, maybe a little harder than the others. That was squamous cell carcinoma which was already involving the ipsilateral inguinal lymph nodes and ultimately led to the death of this patient. But is this an issue in skin of color? And the answer is yes. 4.6%, roughly 5% of hydradenitis patients will develop squamous cell carcinoma. What are the risk factors? Being male, gluteal involvement with the hydradenitis, smoking, the longer the duration of the hydradenitis, and skin of color, particularly African-American. So that makes another risk associated 
with hydradenitis suppurativa that can actually be fatal. And something you should always keep in mind, should one or another of the areas of hydradenitis suddenly look different or feel different or act different than the other more typical spots. Clinical features, I'm just gonna review very quickly. You're familiar, deep-seated pain, painful nodules, which ultimately connect. So they're draining sinus tracts, abscesses, bridging scars between areas of involvement. Late, there may be double open comedones. This involves typically axilla, groin, perineal area, perianal area, the buttocks, the inframammary folds, and much less commonly, the actual abdomen and the neck, but it can be very widespread. It's chronic, recurring, waxing, and waning. There are different ways to assess hydradenitis, all sorts of staging and grading systems. I like the Hurley staging because it's simple. Um, the Hiscar has often been used now in studies. It was, the, it was invented for use in clinical trials, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. Here are some other examples, draining nodules, draining tracts, interconnected tracts. So what are therapeutic measures for hydradenitis suppurativa? And why is that important in skin of color? General therapeutic measures. Number one is adequate pain management. Aside from the embarrassment, the malodor, the draining, the staining clothes, this hurts. But you don't want to get someone addicted. And yet we know we're in the middle of a national opioid crisis, which is even worse in the Black community. So if you're giving someone opioids and they live in a community or have associates and friends who live in a community where opioids are relatively easily accessed, there's a risk, an additional risk of addiction. Smoking makes this worse. We don't actually have worked out why, but we know that's true. In Europe, Hydradenitis is often called smoker's boils. So smoking cessation is important as part of the therapeutic general intervention. But we know there's a disparity. There's increased prevalence of smoking in the skin of color group. So if you want someone to stop smoking, but the people that hang out with are all smoking, it's really hard to stop. That's why it's important to put it in this particular presentation. And then weight loss. We know weight loss helps. And yet there's a disparity in obesity, which is more prevalent in the skin of color group. So if you want someone to lose weight, adopt a healthier diet, but everyone around them is eating horrible stuff that puts weight on, it's a real, real burden to the patient to try and lose weight, just like it's a burden to try and stop smoking and just why it's a risk that they may become addicted to pain management drugs. You can see why weight loss would be helpful. So here are the therapies and time precludes me from going into all of them. Antibiotics generally, are short-lived if they're effective at all. And although clindamycin and rifampin have been popularized, in my hands, they don't work terribly well, or if they do, they don't work for a long time. Recently, several papers have basically resurrected the idea of using intralesional triamcinol and acetonide injections right into draining tracts, right into draining nodules, high concentration, 10, 20, even 40 milligrams per ml. Most patients who are managed in part that way actually like those injections and find they're helpful. 
according to recent publications. Heat therapy may be useful, and you can generate that with a neodymium YAG laser and others that are used for skin tightening for cosmetic reasons, but the heat that's generated may help reduce the activity of hydradenitis. All retinoids might be helpful. And then a variety of other things like metformin, 500 milligrams two to three times a day, finasteride, anywhere from one to five milligrams a day, and spironolactone, 50 to 200 milligrams a day. All of those may be helpful in select patients. What I do what from a medical standpoint is I treat this by stacking agents. I do something, if it doesn't work, we stop it. If it helps, but it doesn't really lead to the kind of improvement the patient and I both would like, then I stack. I add another thing and I add another thing. For biologic drugs, adalimumab is the only one that's approved for hydradenitis suppurativa. But if you really look at the data, it's useful, but it's not uniformly useful. Patients all the time don't respond. So other biologic drugs have been tried. Eustachinumab seems to be quite helpful to start, but often patients flare. It recurs. Secucinumab, based on some studies, looks very useful. The Selcumab looks very useful but all of those are basically trial and error. A premolast has been used. Again, that would be trial and error and try getting it for your patient when the diagnosis isn't psoriasis, not so easy. And then I've listed some things that are being investigated, explored, bermecumab, which is an anti-IL-1A, an anti complement agent, IFX1, and then the JAK inhibitors, the wonder drugs for everything. Now you notice I haven't discussed one thing that's on this list. So what about surgery for hydradenitis? Well, surgery can include everything from just incision and drainage. I would not highly recommend it. There's frequent recurrence. You can unroof tracks or draining nodules scrape out what's left, and then desiccate the base. It's variable recurrence, you know, about 20, 25%, but some stay gone. There may be a prolonged healing time and there may be some scarring. You can use electrocutting to basically excise an area. That's good because there's inherent hemostasis but it's the most likely to leave significant dyschromia and even post-op pain. Then there's wide surgical excision. Just take the whole thing out all the way down to maybe even including fat. That's the lowest recurrence rate and a high satisfaction rate, but we really don't know the optimum approach. There's a reasonably high risk of infection and other morbid side effects. So that's all the surgical interventions. The one thing that's true is that if you give a biologic drug and surgery, they actually do better than either the biologic drug alone or surgery alone. So this is one study from George Washington University in Washington, DC. 72% of their patients were black, and the combination worked better than any individual thing. And another study. So this is a multi-center worldwide study where the combination of biologic therapy and surgical intervention, as opposed to surgery without biological administration, did best. And what they did is they gave, there was a set protocol. They gave adalimumab for 12 weeks pre-surgery. They gave it during the two weeks in the perioperative period and continued it for 10 weeks postoperatively. And the patients who did best got this as opposed to the same surgery with no biologic drug. In this cohort, 
uh, 6% of patients were black. They uniformly did well if they were in the combo group. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about lupus. If you talk about systemic lupus erythematosus, African-Americans may be at a two-time risk compared to ethnic groups and other ethnic groups. This is based on retrospective studies from insurance claims data. It breaks out about 40% of those who have systemic lupus are black, 25% Hispanic, and just a little under that, 21% Caucasian. But among black and Hispanic patients with systemic lupus, it's more severe. If you talk about discoid or subacute cutaneous lupus, the prevalence is the same in all ethnic groups with one small difference, the earlier age of onset in African-Americans and more scar formation was associated with discoid lupus. I'll show you examples in just a second. So here's lupus, discoid lupus, systemic lupus, and skin of color. Notice that the systemic lupus is a little more difficult to recognize in skin of color. Two of those patients are black, one is Hispanic, than it is in Caucasian skin. What you should look for is swelling, swelling of the cheeks surmounted by some degree of erythema. And you can see that erythema best if you examine the face in front of a blue background. That's how you see erythema best in skin of color. This is lupus erythematosus. This is discoid lupus in skin of color. And look at the degree of scarring. You very rarely find this widespread, deep, dyschromic, really debilitating scarring in any other group except African-Americans. You also, just as in hydradenitis, have to worry about the development of squamous cell carcinoma in discoid lupus in skin of color. Because why? It leads to hypochromia. So you have less pigment, more exposure to ultraviolet light, and chronic inflammation, which we know in anything that's chronically inflamed, like a stasis ulcer that's been around forever, you can grow a squamous cell carcinoma. So these are two black individuals with discoid lupus erythematosus who both in areas that had lost pigment grew squamous cell carcinoma. But I don't think it's limited to black individuals. That one passed away. This is from Indian literature from the subcontinent of India. And in this case, there are two cases of squamous cell carcinoma developing in DLE in those from that area. Again, loss of pigment and chronic inflammation. Lupus treatment. Anytime you see a list this long, as you did with hydradenitis, you know that there's no absolutely guaranteed it's going to work on every patient for every subset of the disease medication, or there wouldn't be a list like this, right? Steroids, of course, systemic topical intralesional. Immunosuppressants, of course, azathioprine and methotrexate. Rituximab may be helpful by decreasing autoantibody production. Belimumab and enfrolumab, I'll talk about them in just a second. Mycophenolate may be helpful, but it's not a really great treatment. Thalidomide might be helpful, but again, its rate limiting thing is the development of neuropathy. Antimalarial agents, not for systemic lupus, but for discoid and subacute cutaneous lupus, treatments of choice, antimalarial agents. Retinoids, both topically and systemically, may help those same cutaneous lupus dis disorders, discoid and subacute cutaneous. Topical calcineurin inhibitors might be useful for discoid lupus, and pulse dye laser has been helpful. A large menu. Again, 
many patients with collagen vascular disease are co-managed with rheumatology. Bulimumab is a monoclonal antibody directed against BLYS, which activates B cells, which make the antibodies associated with tissue damage in lupus. It's given IV. It's not a great drug, it's a modest drug, but interestingly enough, black patients do not respond to it. Why, I don't know, but you should know that because if you see cystendesis for systemic lupus, if you see it and it's in a black patient, this is not a drug to consider because it just won't work. On the other hand, anafrolumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against interferon type one receptor. So type one interference can bind to the receptor and interferon kappa seems to, which is a type one interferon, seems to be very important for the idiopathogenesis of systemic lupus. So this works pretty well, objective improvement in about half of patients with sustained improvement in those who respond to it. And when they did the studies on this drug, keeping in mind that polimumab did not work in black patients, they made very sure they included a substantial number of these individuals in the pivotal trials to make sure it actually worked, which it does. We're gonna close by talking just a brief bit about scleroderma, another local as well as systemic disease, right? Scleroderma can be localized, morphia. You may have generalized morphia or linear morphia and coup de sable, usually on the forehead or in the scalp. You may also have systemic scleroderma, progressive systemic sclerosis, which can involve any or all of the organs I've listed there, and limited systemic sclerosis. Crest syndrome with calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. Scleroderma overall, all forms, all comers, is about 200 per million. So it's a relatively rare disease, more common in women than men, and peaks ages 30 to 55. But let's look at some interesting statistics. If you talk about systemic scleroderma, it's 24 per million for black, 18 per million for white, more common in black individuals. The mean age of onset is younger in black individuals than in those who are not black. If you look at what kind of scleroderma do people have, Two thirds of white patients have localized scleroderma, one of the three things listed there. But two thirds of black patients have systemic disease, one of the things listed there, including the often fatal progressive systemic sclerosis. So you can see by these statistics that scleroderma is a worse disease among skin of color, particularly black patients. And then in specifics, based on large case series, black patients are 60% more likely to have cardiovascular or renal involvement than white patients. Black patients have worse pulmonary disease. So it's not just a little fibrosis, it's major fibrosis, major loss of lung function, pulmonary hypertension. And black patients have an 80% increased risk of mortality from systemic sclerosis compared to white patients. Now, if you correct for educational level and you correct for income, that risk falls a little, but it still is increased risk of mortality among black patients compared to non-black, particularly, Caucasian patients. In skin of color, one manifestation is this confetti-like hypopigmentation. Usually starts off as a very small spot, and often people think of vitiligo, 
like the initial manifestations of vitiligo. But when it continues to expand in this confetti-like look, think scleroderma. Start asking about Raynaud's phenomenon, difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing. Look at the fingers. Ultimately, systemic scleroderma leads to this kind of frozen face. That's a black patient and an Indian patient with scleroderma. Look how much similar they are because that's what happens. You can't smile. It's difficult to move your lips. You have kind of a frozen look. Oh, and by the way, your wrinkles kind of disappear, but that's not a good trade off. And sclerodactyly, that hard, frozen, I can't bend my fingers look, ischemic digital ulcers at the fingertips or on the dorsum of the fingers, particularly over bony prominences, the knuckles. So in skin of color, think about confetti-like pigmentation as an early manifestation, particularly on the chest. You can also see it on the back. Think about frozen face, look. Think about sclerodactyly. Those are manifestations of this disease. Therapeutic options, again, there's a long list. There are some things that are really for progressive systemic sclerosis. There are some things that are best for morphia, like antimalarial agents are best for morphia. They don't do as much for systemic sclerosis. That usually is treated with steroids or immunosuppressives. Bulimumab has been used, rituximab, imatinib have been all used. There's several agents there towards the bottom of the list that are just for lung fibrosis. They kind of decrease existing and prevent future fibrosis. And there are several there that are really for pulmonary hypertension. And then last but not least, kind of experimental, autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So lots of treatments. There are others in the works. There are a variety of auto uh, of immune modulatory. There are antibodies, monoclonal antibodies to various and assorted other things that we think may modulate the disease. So you modulate down those antibodies and you might be better. So there's at least a half a dozen of those immunomodulatory agents that are in various stages of testing, mostly for progressive systemic sclerosis, for systemic scleroderma. So the outlook is good in that there are other agents on the way. But this is the current basic therapeutic option list. So I want to thank you for your kind attention while we tiptoed through a few systemic diseases in skin of color. I hope you've picked up a couple of pragmatic pearls and maybe learned something about what to look for from a morphologic standpoint, because we're the front line. We are the ones who are going to see these patients first, often, whether it's sarcoid or it's lupus or it's scleroderma or it's hydradenitis, we are the front line. And we need to make those diagnoses and intervene appropriately and get help when we need it. Thank you very much.